Okay, so the next thing that we're going to introduce is this idea of a Merkle tree. And the Merkle tree is named after this guy here, uh, Ralph Merkle. He's a cryptographer. He has a crazy good CV. You can see here, co-inventor of public key cryptography, right? Especially in cybersecurity and blockchains, it doesn't get any bigger than this. He's also known for the Merkle tree, Merkle puzzles. He's also known for the knapsack crypto system. Um, and I cut it off there, so some other stuff. So Ralph is definitely a legend. And so, you know, what is a Merkle tree and how can we use it? It's just a, a data structure that's going to improve the efficiency of our blockchain. And so we've got a tree-like structure here. It's kind of like a tree that's been turned upside down. So the root is up top. And then we have some nodes that store the hashes. And then we have the information down here as the leaf nodes. So page one, two, three, four. These are the pages out of our ledger that we're keeping track of that have everybody's transactions in them. Storing the pages by themselves is OK. And it's good for small systems, right? It's good for centralized systems. Um, but it's not good for decentralized systems because everybody needs a copy of the pages. So, you know, the more info we chuck into a block, the more you have to send out to everyone in the network. So we want to be able to have this happen efficiently. So what we'll do here for page one, we'll take the hash of page one, that's h of one, and then we'll pair it up with a sibling, and then we'll hash it again, bring those two together, and then at the top of the tree, we're left with a single hash, which is called the Merkle root. If I look back here, we can see that hash, Merkle root, and then right under it is our sub root, our subtree, showing us all of the transactions that should be in that Merkle tree. So why would, why would we want to do this? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take advantage of um, the logarithmic nature of a binary tree. So binary means we only have two options in the tree. Uh, means we only have two leaves per branch in the tree. So, you know, if, if you're building a tree and you have an odd number, then you want to add an additional one so that, your last, uh, so that your last one has a pair to go with. And then if we think about maybe page two has a special transaction that I want to verify. Somebody paid me some Bitcoin and I want to verify that. I don't care about page one, page three and four. I just care about the one that has my transaction in it. And so to verify page two, I need the hash of page one. I don't need to know what page one is. Okay? I just need the hash of page one, so I don't need to know this information. I need this one, and then I can calculate this one. And then I also need the sibling hash. Again, I don't need to know that information. And it's not like it's secret. But we're thinking about efficiency, right? Especially if you're running on like a light client or a mobile phone, you don't want to have to download all this other information. Um, it's easy to download a hash and to check, less easy to download all the source data. So it becomes very efficient. Uh, and then you need to know um, the root. And so what you can do is you can, given the verification path, you can calculate, calculate your own Merkle root compare the two, and that gives you assurance that your transaction is indeed where it should be. Keep in mind that if your transaction is not where it should be, if any of the other information is changed, your hashing at any level in the tree is going to alter the root. So let's look at a bigger tree. We'll say how much to verify. So with a lot of the things we do, we have like small toy examples. You know, in reality, we have to imagine these trees are like thousands of leaves big. And so therefore, it takes a bit of time if you're writing an algorithm to traverse the tree and check every single uh, leaf node. So here's J. If I want to verify J, well, it says HJ. I guess that's the hash of J. What do I need? I need the information. I need the hash of its sibling, so I can get here. I need the hash of its sibling, so I can get here. This sibling to get here, and then the root to finish up. 
So if you're keeping track, that's one, two, three, four that I need. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so there's 16 leaves here. And I only need four pieces of information to verify that my transaction's in the tree. So 16 is the set size, and it took me four checks in order to verify it. So this is uh, you know, two to the four, so this is logarithmic time. And so that's the benefit of the Merkle tree. You can go through the tree in logarithmic time, um, you know, which is really quite ideal in a computing system um, and really adds to your overall efficiency. Now at the same time here, there's another benefit to this, and that is that you don't need to know all the other information. So you can provide somebody a limited information set and this has privacy benefits because you then don't need to necessarily know, depending on the system, you don't need to know what these other leaf nodes are. You can just provide a hash and say, well, by the time I give you this hash, there's no way you can figure out the entire left side of this tree. Now again, for a blockchain system that might be public, you could just go find it, but not all systems perhaps work like that. All right, so hash functions, Merkle trees, these are considered like cryptographic uh, tools. Um, as sort of within the class of cryptography. But really when we think of cryptography, we're probably thinking of, you know, crypto means secret and graph means, means writing. So we're probably thinking of keeping some messages secret such that only the intended recipient can read them. So there's two broad categories here in terms of this idea of keeping stuff secret. There's symmetric and asymmetric. And we'll begin with symmetric here, meaning that we have one key, secret key, to do both encryption and decryption. So we bring in our plain text left to right, use the key to encrypt it. We get a cipher text. That's a little bit, that's out of place. That should be over here. We get cipher text. And if you were to you know, capture the messenger in transit, if you were to eavesdrop, and find this, you would read it and you'd be like, oh, this is gibberish, I can't understand it, right? It doesn't tell me. If you ever try to open and look at an encrypted document and you're like, what the heck, what's going on, right? It's a bunch of symbols. Okay, so we shouldn't be able to read it here. Uh, further on down, um, the intended recipri recipient there, or perhaps as you in the future, uses the same key to then recover the plain text document. So that's symmetric cryptography. The analogy is like one key in a lockbox. Put it in while it's locked. You don't know what's there. Got, you use the same key, right? If you lose your key, that's it. You can't recover what's there. But um, you know, if it's the same, if it's the same entity, and you lose the key, you know that you know the content was there, but you can't recover it again. If it's somebody else, they don't know what's there. Okay, so we're gonna look try to mo give some of the motivation here for why we can implement these systems and have them be secure. Uh, and so we're gonna try to get to something called the discrete logarithm.